Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Ukrainian Institute of America. Uh, my name is Walter Hoydish, and I'm chair of programs at the Institute. Uh, this evening, we are presenting the third, third book of our uh, program called uh, Books at the Institute. Uh, and uh, the book is, as you can see, Giuseppe Bazzini, Young Europe and the Birth of Modern Nationalism in the Slavic World, uh, written by Professor Anna Prozic. <coughs> this event is co-sponsored by the Sochanko Society and Uban as well. Good evening and welcome to the Ukrainian Institute of America tonight's host. This evening's event is co-sponsored uh, repeatedly by the Shevchenko Science Scientific Society, the Ukrainian Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Ukrainian Institute of America. We appreciate your contributions, participation, and fellowship. We are very excited to, become, to welcome tonight's special guest, distinguished professor, historian, community activist, and author, Dr. Anya Prodzik. Her new book, Giuseppe Mazzini's Young Europe and the Birth of Modern Nationalism in the Slavic World, was published recently by the University of Toronto Press. And tonight is Dr. Prodzik's first of what we hope will be many such talks. Uh, following her presentation, I encourage you to ask Dr. Prodzik, I can't help to think, right or wrong, that reading any subject of study needs justification. Its advocates must explain why it is worth attention. Most widely accepted subjects, and history is certainly one of them, attract some people who simply like the information and modes of thought involved. But audiences less spontaneously drawn to the subject and more doubtful about why to bother need to know what the purpose is. I'm not a social or political historian and admit to being intimidated by dense discourse related to a topic of study, not, a, not approximate to my own familiarity. I do, however, and thankful to my late parents and their intellectual pursuits, select teachers, and an active curiosity, love to read a lot. And yet, when I received this copy of Dr. Prodzik's new book, I, I took to it not immediately for the complex subject at hand, but for the artwork gracing its cover. I will defer to the professor to expound on that extraordinary phenomenon during her presentation. And if not, I'll, I'll ask about it later. It was the cultural recognition and knowing the backstory of this element that afforded me seamless easement into this narrative study, a study of thought that helped define identity, unquestionably emphasizing distinctive features of the national experience on many European political fronts and societies in flux within a brief and dizzy period of time. <clears throat> and of course, nations use identity, history, and sometimes abuse it, as illustrated in the book. Histories that tell a national story are meant to drive home an understanding of national values and a commitment to national loyalty. Professor Protzik's new publication and the subject of tonight's presentation brings the, th the thought of Giuseppe Mazzini back into the fold of nationalism studies, from which it has been largely missing for decades. I submit that it suggests the following, that, Maz that Mazzini is much more modern and secular than he is traditionally portrayed, and that his commitment to liberal policies while rejecting liberal principles suggest that the distinction between civic and ethnic nationalism has been misconceived. Broadly speaking, and from my own neophyte view, nationalism for Mazzini was not an end in itself, but a means to an end. Government of, by, and for the people. The appeal for such a government was manifested in three popular demands in post-Napoleonic Europe. In the West, as democracy, in the East as national sovereignty, that is the precondition for democracy, and both East and West as social democracy. 
Thus, nationalism may be instrumental rather than a revolutionary end in itself, and it may be attributable not to ethnic groups' national striving for autonomy, but for the pursuit of a democratic ideal. Commendably written in an accessible and conversational tone, this new book is as much a revelation, fulfilling, filling, I'm sorry, filling a hole in the cross-pollination of Western, Central, and Eastern European revolutionary thought in the 19th century, as it is a good and solid object lesson in a thorough scientific method and process as, as espoused by its author. Research grants from the City University of New York afforded our guest to examine vast archives and libraries in Italy, the Slovak Republic, the Czech Republic, and in Ukraine. Professor Protzik is Professor Emerita in the Department of History, Philosophy, and Political Science at Kingsborough Community College, City University of New York. A distinguished member and officer in the Shevchenko, Society, Shevchenko Scientific Society, the Ukrainian Academy of Arts and Sciences, and member of the Ukrainian Institute of America, Dr. Protzik has published essays and, pre and presented numerous papers at international academic conferences spanning the critically, histor the critically historical to social, including a, including a devoted and passionate consideration and reporting on the human rights movements in Ukraine in the 1960s and 70s. She is the author of Russian Nationalism in Ukraine, the Nationality Policy of the Volunteer Army During the Civil War. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. Anna Prozik. Thank you, Andre, for a wonderful introduction. Introduction to my book. And uh, your introduction will, so to speak, make it easier for me to, to present my main ideas because some of what you have said I planned to uh, also speak about in my presentation. Uh, it is very rare that I have had the opportunity to speak about my favorite subject to an audience with so many of my favorite people. Uh, my former students of so many years, decades and decades ago, I'm, I'm deeply touched. My friends and colleagues and many of my old and recent acquaintances, thank you for coming. It's wonderful to see you here. I'm just hoping that I'm not going to speak too long because once I start talking about my favorite subject, my daughter knows very well what that means. <laughs> Uh, at a uh, recent American Historical Society, um, a society's annual convention, I had a lunch meeting with Mario Di Napoli, the president, former president, and now vice president of the Instituto uh, Domus Mazziniana, the main center of Mazzinian studies in Italy, and I would say in the world as well. In the course of uh, our conversation, I was asked the inevitable question. Where did the idea of Mazzini and the Slavic world come from? I began explaining that um, I began my education in post-war Czechoslovakia at a time when the name of the first president of that country was still highly revered. As I was talking, I noticed that my companion's face brightened, and I immediately knew that I did not have to explain any further. Dr. Napoli knew that Thomas Garik Masaryk was a Mazzini, and that his program for the first Czech modern Czechoslovak state was rooted in the ideology, 
in the program of young Europe. Uh, to some degree, I have been a Mazinian too, even before I heard the name of Giuseppe Mazzini. I was brought up by, I think, the third or fourth generation of young Europeans. And so was Václav Havel, the famous dissident, and at the same time, the first or somewhat later, the first president of post-communist Czechoslovakia. Interestingly enough, both uh, Václav Havel and I were born in the same year, and we were mo most likely taught uh, by young Europeans, third or fourth generation of young Europeans. Um, we, uh, we could, or at least I could, pinpoint who they were by the assignment they were giving, by the subject we were uh, expected to learn, to master, by the hymns that we were singing. One of them in particular is um, clearly embedded in my mind. Um, a hymn that it was actually an ode to those who were willing to give up their life for truth. Dissidents like Václav Havel are not born in spiritual vacuum. And I trust that at least one or two of our reigning party today will follow his example and will not be afraid to lose his popularity, because he or she defends the truth. Uh, so much for the introduction. Um, during my graduate studies at Columbia, I would have definitely, I better keep to my prepared text, because otherwise there is, I will digress too much. And, uh, you don't want to be listening to me forever, because we'll have an opportunity to talk after um, my presentation. During my graduate studies at Columbia, I would have definitely chosen Giuseppe Mazzini and uh, the Slavic world if at that time the archives in Eastern Europe would have been open. They were definitely close to me because of my work in Amnesty International. And I was uh, uh, warned, or at least I was told that by a KGB representative in Kiev when I was visiting that city in 1971. So instead of Mazzini, I chose uh, a different, if not totally unrelated topic, simply because I knew that there were excellent archives here in the United States at the Hoover Institution in California, Stanford University, California, and I had to complete my research in the shortest period of time. So, instead of spending my days and nights for about two years with Mazzini and his romantically inspired young Europeans, I found myself in the company of General Anton Dikin and his comrades in arms. It was not such a bad experience because um, Anton uh, Dinik, um, Ivanovich, Ivan, Ivanovich Dinikin was actually a very good writer and his five volume history of the Russian Revolution and the uh, Civil War in some places reads like a novel. Nevertheless, two years, Anton Dinikin and the generals. I learned, uh, one thing that I learned uh, about, I was not concerned with military matters, but what was most interesting was the hybrid war of the white movement. The hybrid war, the propaganda, that is so similar that we are hearing today coming from Moscow. And as you probably know, Putin admires 
unique. I don't think that unique it would be very happy about that. Uh, the themes of my two bo of my books, uh, the first which was um, uh, published, that is, on the basis of my dissertation, Russian Nationalism in Ukraine, and the last, um, um, the one that we are talking about today, are related, even though the focus of the two books is diametrically opposed to one another. In the first book, I write about an attempt of an imperial nation to reunite by force an empire. In my Mazzini book, I speak of, <coughs> I write of an effort on the part of subjugated nationalities to form an alliance for the purpose of overthrowing the empires of Russia and Austria and the bases and on their ashes, establish democratic republics based on equality and freedom. And this is exactly what Young Europe was. It was established by Giuseppe Mazzini in 1834 in Switzerland, and that is all nationalities under these huge empires were invited to participate in this effort. Three years before the founding of Young Europe, uh, Polish revolutionaries, well, most of the nationalities were, uh, that is, um, lost their independence sometime during the Middle Ages as a result of the invasions from the East, from, from Asia. With one exception, Poland alone was able to maintain its um, independence and even a parliamentary form of government until the end of the 18, uh, 19th, 18th century, when its three strong neighbors with autocratic regimes partitioned it. And I think most of you remember the partition of Poland. It is uh, an event that is difficult to forget because some of the Polish revolutionaries actually fought in the later when they were um, Polish revolutionaries that wanted to regain their independence, uh, fought in the American Revolution. Uh, this was uh, still in the 18th century after the first partition, but there were Poles that fought in this fourth attempt, and it is this fourth attempt that I emphasize in my book. Mm. What I stress in particular is the fact that this, that the Polish Revolution has been um, understated. Uh, the effect of the revolution has been minimized in most history book. And I try to bring it to light in my study. Uh, it will be the some eight, uh, the leaders of some 8,000 Polish emigres who fled from the territories of the Russian Empire to the West that will be, to a great degree, responsible for, the, for, making, uh, for making it possible for Mazzini to form, to establish young Europe, and their role in this project will be instrumental, not only at the beginning, but also that is, um, as the years go on. Uh, the right hand of Mazzini, uh, the, second, um, uh, the second image, um, Shimon Konarski, still a very young man uh, in those years, uh, was uh, 
perhaps was most active was the right hand of Giuseppe Mazzini in forming other organizations uh, that would participate or that would join Young Europe. In particular, he was instrumental in forming a strong young Poland. And um, Mazzini was of the opinion that without Poland, um, young Europe would not be possible. The um, uh, energy and the enthusiasm which the Poles, defeated Poles by Russia, generated, that is, uh, was truly remarkable. And this um, enthusiasm, uh, so to speak, was had an uh, effect that could be detected in various ways. For example, uh, we, um, the, as the revolutionaries uh, were fleeing from the Russian Empire through Central and Western Europe, young people, especially young people in those countries, uh, were, were translating uh, the Polish revolutionary songs into their languages, were singing them at various demonstrations and even revolts. And obviously, this was detected by Giuseppe Mazzini, who was a very, very keen political observer, even at his young age, his late 20s at that time, and you can see his image, the first image was precisely, uh, it was made uh, precisely at the time when he was establishing Young Europe. Um, at this time, some totally apolitical composers and writers and artists who came to Paris in order to deepen their art studies uh, would immediately turn would compose um, melodies with national themes and would write poems and works of literature that would involve that subject. The strongest impact of the Polish uprising, as could have been expected, but it is not stressed in most history books, was on East Galicia, on the Ukrainians in East Galicia. This was logical because that is of the proximity of this province to uh, the territory where the Russo-Polish War was fought. And many of the Pol uh, Poles fleeing after the uh, conflict was crushed would actually remain in East Galicia. Uh, during the struggle itself, um, Ukrainians and some Slovak and Czech joined as volunteers in the fighting. Among the Slovak volunteers was um, a seminarian by the name of Samo Kalupka, who later will become a prominent uh, Slovak poet. Among the Czechs, we have František Zok, and among the Ukrainians, we have Teofil Kuczynski and over a dozen that we know of, of seminarians who joined the fighting. For obvious reasons, this was kept in secret, and we were able to learn, or at least we are able to learn today, about their participation only from the obituaries. Uh, there actually are records that show that the Polish revolutionaries were, as they were fleeing from Russia, Ukrainian priests readily provided not only shelter, but also issued false certificates to prevent the freedom fighters' deportation to Russian-held territories. Among those uh, who remained in Galicia was the Polish poet, Severin Koszczynski, the future leader of Young Poland's branch in, <coughs> excuse me, in uh, East Galicia, which actually the city um, 
of Lviv will become the center of young Poland's activities in Austria, in the territories held by Austria and Russia. So here you can see why the impact was so strong. And yet, in history books, Ukrainian history books, uh, not to mention Western books, this is barely mentioned. Uh, I, perhaps during the discussion period, I will be able to elaborate on that subject. The enthusiasm and awakened nationalism that the local youth was experiencing in that province is recorded in letters, reminiscences, and literary work. A Greek Catholic theology students, by the way, most of those who participated in Young Europe were, that is, tied to um, religious studies. And uh, Mazzini, that is, so, saw a great potential in the priests, that is, in, um, in that particular uh, profession for his work in Italy as well, because they are the closest to the people and they do have access to the people. In among the Ukrainians and Slovaks and Czechs, that is, the intelligentsia of those years consisted almost exclusively of that profession. And this is what a young um, seminary student wrote in, at this time. Some kind of a great spirit of freedom has overwhelmed me. I had a dream which caused a profound change within me. I dreamt <coughs> excuse me, that I had liberated the Ruthenians and given them independence. Ruthenian was the official name given to the Ukrainians in the Austrian Empire. This has become such a mania with me that I can think of nothing else. I have great plans. The Ruthenians are most on my mind. Similar sentiment was expressed in the recollections of one of the leading members of Ukrainian intelligentsia in the 1830s, um, Yaki Kolovatsky, who reminisced a few years later. Not too long ago, a new spirit, a Ruthenian spirit, began to appear. Neither a genius awakened our somnolent nation, nor any internal event had shaken the nation. Perhaps it was the neighboring thunder that sounded, or the example of the other Slavic nations. Obviously, he has in mind the Poles and the Polish Revolution and the Russian struggle. This set of uh, thoughts and reminiscences, I must conclude with one that I have already cited on a number of occasions, and some of you uh, may be hearing it for the third time, uh, but it so well expresses the way that Mazzini thought the followers of young Europe would think that I have to say it again. And here it is. Nothing can restrain us from the pursuits common to the whole Europe. And we shall not be silent unless Europe becomes silent. We all want to be free together with other European nations and are patiently yearning to attain this goal. We want to be a nation, and without doubt will become one, because the voice of the people is the voice of God. We Ruthenians fervently believe in the resurrection of a free, independent Ruthenia. Will this be realized in the near future, or later, is of no great significance. Distance in time does not trouble us, because what does a century represent from the perspective of a nation's existence? It was written, that is, uh, a decade after the, the period that I described, but it sounds as if it has been written just yesterday. On the basis of these and other documentary sources, my study argues that the national awakening in Eastern Europe in the 1830s was not only cultural, as it is always presented, especially in Marxist works, 
but also political. And this, that, and that this could be attributed both to the impact of the Polish Revolution of 1830 as well as the influence of young Europe. Uh, influence of young Europe through the emissaries that were sent and through the flow of ideas disseminated by Mazzini's special library of revolutionary books and pamphlets shipped from this uh, primarily Marseille, where the library was located, into the territories of uh, the Austrian and Russian Empire. <coughs> One of the biggest surprises that I had, that is, as I was looking through this material, was the degree of sophistication of this, these young people. Uh, some of you probably know that the, in the Austrian Empire, the education was one of the best in Europe. And indeed, that is, this can be evident from the writings, from the works, um, and from the behavior of these young people. The uh, panegyrics that many Ukrainians, I'm sure, have read about, that the young seminarians were voicing, that is, in uh, um, praise of the Austrian emperor, that is, what actually a camouflage. Some of the best of these speeches were delivered by young men who were in the underground organization tied to uh, the association of um, uh, Polish um, of Polish people. This is how young Poland was known in the, that is, on the territories of Austria and Russia for obvious reasons. Young Europe was the most feared organization in the West by the rulers, in particular by uh, Prince Metternich, the feared uh, prime minister of What were the signs of awakening nationalism among the Czechs and the Slovaks at that time? The most active among the Czechs was Franciszek Kambeli, also initially a theology student who later turned to medicine. And he was the link of the Czechs and the Slovaks, a direct link to young Poland. Uh, through Krakow. This is how one of Kambelik's contemporaries evaluated this young man's work, his role among the Czechs and the Slovaks in the 1830s. And I quote, it was through French Kambelik's efforts that national consciousness was awakened at the Faculty of Philosophy and at the Theological Seminary in Brno, from where it would spread through the land of Moravia. After being ordained as priests, we were sent to various corners of the diocese. This was the mustard seed planted among the graduates that later grew, as you can see, to a mighty tree. The later period, of course, um, uh, what the writer had in mind about the later period was the time of Tomasz Masel. The Slovak young Europeans were more numerous and much better organized than the Czech, their Czech contemporary counterparts. This was partly because they had an exceptional leader in Alexander Vorkowski, um, a brilliant law student, and because of their proximity to Vienna, a city in which we would find at that time a very large number of Polish students, they would be the students who were expelled from the universities um, in their homeland, but were permitted to study in Vienna. Uh, the Austrian uh, authorities were not the same as the Soviets. Uh, they usually studied medical studies, uh, they usually studied medicine, but not only medicine, and they had an enormous impact 
and Czechs, Slovaks, Ukrainians, and also Southern Slavs. Uh, Burkowski, by the way, uh, that is, uh, had, uh, was responsible for organizing the best functioning, uh, organi uh, best fun functioning um, unit of young Europe called Vzajomnost, uh, which means reciprocity. As you can see, the local young European groups uh, wore different names, and for that reason, very often, they were overlooked by historians. Not all historians, though. I'm not the first one to detect their presence. Verkhovsky attributed his conversion to the national idea to an exceptionally gifted Polish student by the name of Zajnczkowski, who, as he notes in his brief autobiographical sketch, awakened in him a sense of national dignity. And interestingly enough, uh, very often we find the word national dignity in the writings of the people of this generation. The role of the Polish emissaries of young Europe had played has been greatly underrated. Uh, from the very beginning, even before I began, to do research, I knew that the Poles will play an important role in the movement. I never realized that they will play the central role. And here we have to credit to Giuseppe, give credit to Giuseppe Mazzini that he was able to grasp this potential and, um, uh, so to speak, uh, organize. Uh, a group of dedicated people that would carry on these ideals. Mazzini is a fascinating figure. There are at least 10 biographies of Mazzini in the English language alone, good biographies. Um, and there are thousands, uh, I think in one study I read 40 thousand letters, 40,000 of his letters. He had a long life and he lived mostly in emigration after he fled from his native Genoa uh, in, the, um, in 1831. Um, so the material is just overwhelming. In fact, it was one of the strongest impediments, uh, biggest impediments that I had to overcome. The material was so interesting that I just could not stop writing. Uh, and even when I began, that is, I would be always tempted to read a new study that I would find. But it was a pleasure, a great pleasure. But, well, I had to postpone my writing for a few years more. Uh, it would be, uh, so to speak, impossible for me to summarize his, his uh, significance, his personality, in one or two paragraphs today. So instead, I would um, recommend uh, the best biography in English, the best biography of Mazzini that focuses on his ideas by uh, Roland Sarti. Um, which came out about two decades ago, but it is still the best study of Mazzini. And I thought I would end my presentation by reading some excerpts from my conclusions because a book talk uh, should have, that is, uh, a book reading as well. <laughs> unless, that is, unless you are too tired to listen. I don't even know how much time. Uh, I have spent. <clears throat> East European nationalism, rooted in the humanistic ideals of young Europe, was bound, I'm sorry, was broad in scope and multi layered in content. In it, in it the political, cultural, moral, and universal principles 
were masterfully brought together into a coherent whole with each component complementing and reinforcing one another. It was primarily political because young Europe placed the idea of self-determination of nations at the forefront of its program, an idea according to which each nationality had the right to lead an independent existence in accordance with the will of the people. But in addition to being political, Mazzini's brand of nationalism was also cultural. For the Italian political thinker, the chief purpose, in fact, the very raison d'etre of the state's existence, was to assure the development of a nation's culture and provide adequate safeguards for the preservation of natural spiritual treasures. Uh, Mazzini believed that if tradition is uh, eradicated, this also leads to the um, uh, degeneration of the morals among the people. And this was, in essence, what uh, significance of culture. Uh, in fact, if he did not feel obliged to become involved in politics, and he got involved in politics because he saw the great deterioration in Italian culture when he compared, for example, the Italian language of his day to that of Dante. And that is uh, what was responsible for the eradication of traditions and the decline of culture was the foreign domination over most of Italian principalities and city-states. The two northern uh, most, uh, the wealthiest um, sec um, sections, Venetia and Lombardy, were directly annexed to Austria uh, after the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, many of the northern Italian states were under the puppets of um, uh, Prince Metternich of Austria. And in the other principalities, we had foreign, uh, or we had kings of foreign dynasties. So independence was important in order to prevent the deterioration of culture. And with the deterioration of culture, uh, there is deterioration of morals. And without morals, economy and social just, uh, economic development and social justice were not possible. Um, Mazzini's nationalism was also universal in the sense that the ultimate political aim of young Europe was the creation of a free union of independent nation, nation states cooperating with one another for their individual well-being, as well as for the benefit of the entire human community. A reflection of this idea, though on a similar, smaller scale, uh, would be found in the uh, political program of the uh, Cyril and Metobius Brotherhood, uh, which was founded um, in Kyiv by Ukrainian intellectuals. Um, the Similarity between the program of this group and the program of Young Europe has been mentioned by a number of uh, historians, uh, both in the East and also in the West, but it has never been proven. What I try to do in my book is to show the channels, the underground railroads, that is, through which the ideas were flowing from the West to Galicia and also as far as Cape and to other parts of these empires as well. But these are the parts that I focus in my book. Lastly, Mazzini's political thought also included a spiritual co component by emphasizing the idea that the recovery of uh, authentic national traditions 
and values was essential for the moral regeneration of subjugated nations, and that without such spiritual renewal, no meaningful progress in the political, economic, and cultural sense was possible. Well, this is just repetition of what I just said. Sorry. Uh, Martini's nationalism embodied both the traditional and modern, the national and universal, the political and cultural, the worldly, and spiritual. Thus, it was embraced with enthusiasm by the youthful, well-educated, forward-looking intelligentsia of the subjugated nations, sub the subjugated nationalities, ruled by conservative regimes of the Habsburgs and the Romans. One element found missing in, Mazzinian, in the Mazzinian concept of a nation is the 20th century social Darwinist notion of racial exclusiveness or ethnic purity. What mattered in determining one's nation identity or allegiance from a point of view of young Europeans was not so much the purity of one's family lineage or race, but the spirit of the milieu that molded an individual's personality and shaped an individual's world outlook. Uh, two of Mazzini's closest friends who actually remained with him throughout his very lengthy, some 30 or perhaps even 40 years, of exile, first in France and later in England, were two um, Italians of Jewish background. So it was, that is, it is a nationalism up since it is based on the, so to speak, Judeo-Christian tradition of Europeans. It is not racist, and very often today, uh, and this is partly due to the, I would say, Marxist influence, because this was not accepted when I was a student or during my first years of, first decades of teaching. Today, each nationalism is associated uh, with uh, chauvinism, with Nazism, with fascism, as if there were not, not different shades of nationalism just like there are different shades in socialism. And this is very dangerous because, well, this sentiment, this sentiment is not going to be eradicated from our society. The problem is that some people do not know that there exists other nationalism than the extreme one, which uh, uh, Mazzini would have and the young Europeans would have condemned. And on this, I will conclude my talk.